Thank you for joining us for this evening's program, examining Chancellor Angela Merkel's legacy and Germany's future with Dr. Constanze Stelzenmuller and Dr. Karen Donfried. I'm Claire Noble, the Director of Programming for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our Executive Director, Dale Mosier, our Board Chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium Board, welcome. We are in our 49th year of convening locally and thinking globally. Two items to be aware of before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see an option for Q&A. That's where you'll type your questions for tonight's speakers, and we'll get to those later in the program. We'll get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded, and we'll be posting that recording to veilsymposium.org. Just give us a few days to get that up there. I'd like to take just a moment to thank some of the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Jeannie and Dale Mosier have underwritten the winter season. Cindy Ingalls has underwritten the geopolitical series. And our Underwriters for this evening's program are Laura Temperi, Doris Duton, and Nina and Ken Weiss. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Thank you to all of our donors. If you would like to help us continue our thought-provoking programming, please visit veilsymposium.org to donate. I wanna let you know about a program we have coming up a week from tonight that's really topical and really trending right now. As you may have seen earlier this week, the United States House of Representatives passed the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Just today, Axios Denver released some startling data about a tremendous, tremendous uptick in crime in Denver from 2019 to 2020. So with that backdrop, we have offered the program on policing and police reform in America. That's going to take place on Thursday, March 11th at 6 p.m. And we've assembled a really formidable group of scholars on this topic. Raphael Mangual from the Manhattan Institute, Vikrant Reddy from the Koch Institute, um, Vail Police Chief Dwight Henninger, and our moderator will be Colorado Public Radio Justice Reporter Allison Sherry. Again, that's a week from tonight on March 11th. Now we turn our attention to a discussion of Chancellor Angela Merkel's legacy and Germany's future. Our distinguished guests are Dr. Constanze Stelchenmuller, an expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign and security policy and strategy. She is the inaugural holder of the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations in the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. And Dr. Karen Donfried, President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, formerly the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European Affairs on the National Security Council at the White House. More extensive bios can be found at veilsymposium.org. And I've also included links in the chat to their profile pages at their organizations. I've also included a link to a program that the Brookings Institution will be hosting on March 9th on US-German relations. You can find that in the chat. But remember, if you want to ask a question, please put your questions in the Q&A. And I will turn our program over to Dr. Karen Donfried to begin questions. Thanks so much, Claire. It's such a pleasure to be part of the Vail Symposium tonight, and I'm just delighted to be having a conversation with Constanze about Germany. And this is the year to have the conversation about Angela Merkel, because she is in her final year of her fourth term. So she's finishing out her 16th year in office, which is quite remarkable. And I wanted to start, Constanze, by asking you the question actually in the title of the symposium. Angela the Almost Great, an examination of German Chancellor Merkel's legacy. Constanze, you have watched Chancellor Merkel closely over these 16 years. Is she almost great? Is she great? 
or is she not great at all? What do you think her legacy is? Well, first of all, um, thanks to the Veil vale Symposium for inviting you and me to do this conversation. And the only thing I, I regret about it, and I do re regret that deeply, is that we're not in Veil. Vale. I feel that that is, um, I, I'm going to have to find somebody to blame for that. Um, probably not the Communist Party of China, but still, um, it is upsetting. But um, it's, it's amazing that this should even be a topic of, of interest um, to Americans and, and to the um, folks who follow the Vail Symposium. And I think that's a testament to just how much Angela Merkel, uh, as one of Germany's three post-reunification chancellors, really has shaped and overseen the rise of German power. Um, remember that when she came to power by a very, very thin margin in 2005, winning over Gerhard Schroeder, who first thought that he'd actually won and told her so, remember in that famous TV show at the, in the night when the polls weren't clear. Um, you know, she was the first woman to ever run for chancellor. She was an East German. She was a Lutheran pastor's daughter. She was the least probable person of the, the candidates in 2005 to be running and then to be winning it. And the fact that she's held on for power for 16 years is really is remarkable. And let me add two points to what you've just said. Um, she has already exceeded the second longest running chancellor, and that is the founding chancellor of West Germany, Konrad Adenauer, who is very, very old by the end um, and somewhat not at the height of its powers. She also, despite her having some distinct fluctuations in popularity, remains by a long shot Germany's most popular politician. And despite recent struggles with the pandemic, the Germans give her government good marks. She's been called in between the leader of the free world by American and British commentators who admittedly were frustrated with their own leaders. And yeah, she has overseen German, a meteoric rise of Germany as to really the economic and political anchor nation in Europe, which is not to say that I won't criticize her policies or Germany's positions, but it, it's been an astounding, a degree of shaping power, a tenacity that is unparalleled in modern German history. And let me address the, the, the title question. Um, a TV documentary, uh, on her once noted that there is a picture of a historical figure on her desk in the chancellery. Mm -hmm. And that's an engraving of Catherine the Great, who famously was an East German princess in the 18th century who was sent eastwards to Russia and ended up ruling the Russian empire for a very long time and very successfully, again, against all expectations. Um, there was a bit of a play on that, and yes, I do think that she is almost great rather than great because her, her tenure has had some significant downsides. So let's, let's try to unpack Angela Merkel as a person, because I think she can seem somewhat enigmatic. You mentioned that she's been on some magazine covers as the leader of the free world. But in some ways, she's a surprising person to be designated as that. She isn't naturally charismatic. She isn't a big personality. Many people see her as a sober leader who you know, is, is consistent in pursuing a particular course, but isn't one for drama. So that's one view of her. But then if we look over the sweep of these 16 years, there have also been moments when she's made dramatic decisions. We saw in the wake of the Fukushima disaster in Japan that Merkel made a decision that Germany was going to phase out of nuclear power, and that was in 2011. In 2015, with the refugee crisis, we saw her make a dramatic decision to welcome an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of refugees into Germany. So help us get a better sense of who she is and how she makes decisions. Well, um, that's, that's a, a question for a whole evening. Um, and one that has confounded, I think, not just German analysts, but a lot of the diplomats um, and her peers in, in the West and beyond it. 
Um, I think that, yes, I mean, you're entirely right. The, 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 she is notable for a complete absence of public charisma. Few people, I mean, the, let me use a somewhat unusual comparison. Um, for those of you who have, who have read the Smiley novels of John le Carré, George Smiley was this sort of cerebral, hugely strategic character who, however, struck most people who met him for the first time as sort of vague, very vague and somewhat dumpy and unmemorable. And I think that that is how she, when she was quite young and Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Unification, selected her first as press speaker for the Conservative Party and then for really the most condescending job on offer in his first post-reunification cabinet, which was Minister for Family. Um, and I think that included also seniors and sports um, as a portfolio. It was kind of the grab bag, the kitchen sink of what was left over after everybody else got theirs. Um, I think that nobody, nobody realized that there was a keen strategic calculating planning intelligence beneath that sort of quite apparently quite deliberately um, opaque and some thought frumpy exterior. I mean, you remember how, how the sort of the women politicians of the 1980s and 90s and later cultivated their appearance. Condi Rice, you know, the Acre suits, the stiletto heels, the, the Jim Hone body, Margaret Thatcher's shoulders, the bows and the, and the handbag to bang on the table with. Uh, Merkel does none of that. She wears, she wears these, you know, an endless variety of, of jackets, black pants, sensible shoes, you know, no flashy jewelry, I think a dime store, a dime store watch, and, and that's it. And I think that that is part of her, her fascination is that she has completely avoided the trappings of power. But it's also, I think, and you know this, Karen, from your time um, in, in the Obama administration, uh, that she is known to be in private extremely shrewd and also very, very funny. Journalists will, will tell you that she is incredibly good at imitating politicians, including, I think, Vladimir Putin. Um, and in fact, she, can, she has a hilarious sense of humor. Um, and I think it's this sort of combination of deliberate opacity and a very keen intelligence that, uh, and, and yet a sort of an insistence on prudence and calculation that has, I think, frustrated a lot of people, including your boss, Barack Obama, occasionally, although they then had a much warmer relationship. Well, and it's so interesting because after 16 years, she still has maintained remarkable popularity within Germany. And Constance, it was interesting because when you said you would say she's almost great because of some of the challenges and mistakes that have been made, and you mentioned the pandemic. And the pandemic is also an interesting example because if we look to spring of last year, to the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, many people saw this as her moment, that it what was on display was her supreme competence, her understanding of science, her rationality in managing the pandemic. But mm -hmm. then if you fast forward to where we are now, it's almost completely flipped. And the headlines, one of the recent headlines I saw said, Germany loses COVID crown after vaccine campaign fails. And when mm -hmm. you think about where Germany is today on the pandemic, is it fair to put that at the doorstep of the Merkel government? Or is it about German federalism? Or was the mistake giving the European Union responsibility for the vaccination process? So how, how do you, what is your judgment on the pandemic and, and what so, it tells us about our leadership? You know, I, I, um, I tend to think that one shouldn't put the pandemic at her doorstep. In fact, the pandemic has, is, is you know, as part of the, the power story, is notable for a distinct evolution in her style. The, the, the moment that the pandemic started really hitting in Germany, and let us keep in mind here that Germany for the longest time had a much lighter lockdown and much lower case, uh, case rates than say France or Italy or Spain. Uh, my fellow German citizens who like to moan 
were moaning about what was essentially a much lighter, bur lighter burden and much lighter impositions by the government than we were seeing in other parts of Europe. And I think it was Merkel who, you know, the trained sci scientist, she's a physical chemist with a, with, a, with a doctorate, you know, was looking at the numbers and increasingly concerned about the, the exponential growth of what she was seeing and increasingly concerned about the ability of German governance structures, of which federalism is a key element, um, to, to adequately deal with this. And of course, of the perhaps the unwillingness of the German population to sort of understand what they were being hit with and behave accordingly. There were no mask mandates in Germany for quite a long time because Merkel kept saying, I want you to act of your own free will. I want you to understand the challenge and I trust in your ability to do the right thing. And in, over the course of time, her appeals to, to Germans became much more passionate, much, more, much clearer and much more empathetic in a really marked departure from the way that she has tended to communicate over the past 15 years. But the reality is that, of course, she is in, in, at the end of her tenure, she said that she's not running again. She is, by the way, the first chancellor to not run again, mm -hmm. to not lose power in an, in an election uh, he was fighting for. Mm -hmm. And the, the governors of, of Germany's 16 states are engaged in a power battle for, the, for power in the party and for, for the leadership of the country and for the composition of the coalition that will rule the country after the September 26th elections. And so I think for a long time, um, the, the, there was a great deal of jockeying among the governors, the, the minister presidents, that was a little more about power politics and the election and a little less about the pandemics. And finally, I think it has to be said, and I somewhat, I suppose, paradoxically admire her for that, it was Merkel who was, I think, most insistent, not just on the, the responsibility and freedom of choice of the individual system, but on the rightful role of the, of the states and their governors and the vertical um, uh, separation and balance of powers. I think that is profoundly important to her. And I have to say, I think there's a, quite a lot of blame to go around on the level of the governors. Interesting. And you referred earlier to Chancellor Merkel's relationship to Barack Obama. And I did for a time have a front row seat on that. And in some ways, their personalities are very similar. You know, we used to say no drama Obama. And I think you could say no drama Merkel as well. Um, but there were lots of really challenging issues that they had to deal with, whether it was the future of the Eurozone, whether it was the Snowden disclosures, and Russia. And I want to dig into Russia a little bit with you, Constanza, um, because I think also people often are not certain about what Merkel really thinks about Russia. And I think back to my time in government, and on the one hand, after Russia illegally annexed Crimea in 2014, Merkel was the one who really led the charge within the European Union on sanctions against Russia. And she was very closely united with Barack Obama in the view that it was not acceptable in the 21st century for a bigger, stronger country to illegally annex the territory of its weaker neighbor. And she, I thought, showed tremendous spine in pushing that through an EU that consisted of member states with very different views of Russia. And we just saw earlier this week, the EU and the US agree on a new set of sanctions in the follow-up to the opposition politician Navalny having been poisoned, having been arrested, and now having been imprisoned. So that's one facet of it. On the other hand, we still have this German-American disagreement about a gas pipeline from Russia to Germany, Nord Stream 2. 
the Obama administration didn't like it, the Trump administration didn't like it, and Joe Biden doesn't like it either. And on that, people say, well, this is about Merkel's wanting to maintain a business relationship with Russia and not standing up for these values. Unpack her view of Russia. Yeah, um, well, you've already um, named some key elements. Um, and it's true, you, you know, what you said about Barack Obama just now is I think she originally thought he was something of a showboater and too inexperienced for his job. That was very clear. She thought he was glib and he didn't have enough substance. And then I think she, she very swiftly understood that he was this very cerebral um, and very sort of sometimes excruciatingly, I think for people like you, deliberative decision maker with a mindset much like hers. And, and as you know, um, there are reports from people who've written books about the Obama administration um, that, that document that they had a close friendship at the end. And in fact, that his last visit was, was to her. They had dinner together in the Adlon Hotel in Berlin, a long one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, and I think some people think that that may have played a role in her decision to run again for a fourth term, which she originally hadn't planned. On Russia, um, keep in mind that Merkel had grown up in East Germany. She wasn't, you know, a public dissident. She wasn't, she didn't march on the streets with candles in her hands and with, with armed police waiting in the side streets as some did and some of my friends did. But I think she, she's made it very clear in her own, in, 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 in her interviews with her biographers that she distrusted, disliked and disapproved of the regime and that her true, you know, lodestar lay in the West and, and in America. But that she also, I think she would say, overestimated the longevity, the stability of the regime, and therefore was surprised as famously in the sauna when the wall, the, on the night that the wall came down. And, and she says in her biographies that she, the next morning, she took a walk across to West Berlin, took a look around and walked back. Um, a far less dramatic introduction to what was going to become reunified Germany than for many, many other East Germans. Um, but her generation grew up being taught Russian, having to learn to speak it fluently, interacting with Russian scientists, but also I think knowing enough of Russia to I think like the people, but despise the government. <laughs> yeah. And to understand you know, the fundamental um, you know, corruptness of both of both the Soviet uh, the Soviet Union and the Russian regime. Um, it's also, I think, generally known that that she does not think very highly of Vladimir Putin. Um, there's this famous GIF of her from a G7 meeting where he's talking at her and she's rolling her eyes. Um, I think that that's a very telling moment, and and uh, I suspect that that is her feeling about him in a nutshell. Um, and as you say, she was, she, she has held together the European sanctions, sanctions consensus um, for, you know, ever since the, the annexation of Crimea and the, and for all the duration of the proxy war in, in Russia. I, th I think that, that the m misapprehension in America often a little bit is, is the assumption that because Germany imports a fair amount of its energy, the numbers are between 30 and 50% of its, of its gas from Russia, that that makes it in some way beholden to Russia in terms of foreign and security policy. And I think what you've just said about the sanctions consensus, which cost Germany and German business real money, and about Navalny being treated in Germany, and his mistreatment, subsequent mistreatment in Russia leading to further European sanctions. I think all that tells you where, where the Germans are. Germans don't like authoritarian nations invading bits of Europe or neighbors uh, or, 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 or their neighbors. And I remember vividly discussions between senior, um, at, at conferences between senior uh, German government officials and Russians in, uh, in 2014, where it became very clear that the Russians just weren't listening to what they're being told. They were unable to read the room. 
And at the same time, however, there is in sort of this innate caution in Merkel that, for example, led her to deeply frustrate the Brits after the, the, the poisoning attempt on the Skripals mm -hmm. in Salisbury by, by two GRU agents, where the, the Brits wanted the rest of their Western allies to immediately um, sign the, uh, you know, uh, join with them in blaming the Kremlin for this. And Merkel held back for a very long time. Ditto, she held back for a very, an unconscionably long time, in my view, on attributing the, the, the source of the, the legendary Bundestag hack, the server hack in 2015. A Chechen dissident was murdered in the Tiergarten, Germany's version of Central Park, Berlin's version of Central Park, in, I think, 2019. And the Germans hesitated to attribute it. That, however, has changed within the last 12 months. And so that makes Nord Stream 2 seem like even more of an anomaly. And honestly, I'm I'm as frustrated as it by as by by it as I think a lot of uh, the the Americans are and a lot of our uh, neighbors are. I tend to think that Nord Stream Two began as something of a sop to German business, um, in recompense for the uh, for the the cost of the sanctions. Um, I think Berlin mistakenly thought that its support for Ukraine. And its, its improvement in energy storage, uh, gas, gas storage, and re reverse flow of options would calm down concerns in Eastern Europe and in Ukraine, and also serve as a deterrence to the Kremlin. And in reality, this has remained a festering sore, and, and I think is one of the most politically damaging projects that Merkel has supervised. And I think she should have um, let go of it, quote unquote, long ago. That said, you, you, you mentioned Fukushima. After Fukushima, Merkel said, okay, we're going out of nuclear energy because she, with her astute sense of what the average German was concerned about, realized that this was, could, be a, could break her, her, her hold on power and public consent. And after that happened, the, the energy companies concerned in Germany sued the German government for, for somewhat short of 10 billion euros. And so I think the great fear in the chancery is a, is a recurrence of a lawsuit over billions of, Europe, of euros. And, on the, and so there has been an attempt to finagle and finesse this, opposed by a, uh, in, an American ambassador under Trump who shall, not, who shall remain nameless, who insisted on, nailing, on attempting to nail Merkel to the cross for this, and a bipartisan consensus in the Senate where you had three senators writing to the mayor of a small Baltic seaport saying, you will be punished. You will live to regret the day on which this pipeline makes landfall in your port. And I tend to think that there are sane versions in between that now the, the, the Biden administration is trying to work for. Suspension, security guarantees, supply guarantees for the Ukrainians and Eastern Europeans. Uh, that would avoid this kind of maximalist disaster scenario. Sorry, that was a long answer because this is a complicated story. And frankly, I wish I wish it would just whimper and go away. <laughs> well, and Constantin, you did a great job of capturing the complexity of this relationship with Russia. And it seems to me that a relationship that is as complex, if not more complex, we go. Germany has with China. Yep. And there was a lot of attention at the end of last year when in the dark days of December, the European Union concluded a comprehensive agreement on investment with China. It was at the end of Germany's presidency of the European Union. It was widely seen as an achievement that Merkel very much wanted to achieve before the end of the presidency and that she was the driving force behind it. There was concern that this was being done before there was an opportunity for the incoming Biden administration to work with Merkel on China. There have been a lot of concerns expressed by members of the European Parliament, which have to approve the agreement, including German members of the European Parliament, saying, how can we be concluding an investment agreement when we see what's happening to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and what's happening to democracy activists in Hong Kong? And in many ways, you could say this agreement captures also the duality of Merkel's relationship with China. And I'd right. love your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so unlike the relationship with Russia, where the economic 
the economic nexus between Germany and Russia is a not very large because the 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 share of Russian gas in the composition of Germany's energy budget is is not that important. Um, the economic relationship with China is is massive, and it is very hard to prevent it from, from to pre prevent this from having a political impact. I think that Merkel has quite successfully kept the economic and the political relationship with Russia apart. But with China, that's really hard for a variety of reasons uh, that have to do as much with Berlin as with, um, as with China, with Beijing. Um, you know, it's, it's true that right after the breakup of the, of the Soviet Union, there was something of a Klondike atmosphere in Western capitals and in Berlin, where, where Western companies and German banks thought they were going to make ginormous profits, um, introducing capitalism to, to the poor benighted Eastern Europeans and the Russians. Um, and I'm inclined to think that, that, that the, the ruthlessness of those endeavors generated a fair amount of resentment um, that, um, I think we are now feeling the impact. That's that's the one point on which I think I, I tend to think we ought to feel more empathy than we do. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that as soon as um, Yeltsin transitioned to Putin and Putin took power and his cronies basically took power over the 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 the, the resource apparatus of of Russia, um, those Klondike years ended and German business got fairly badly burned. So business exposure to Russia compared to German business exposure to China is, is minimal. Russia, I think, is still somewhere between the Czech Republic and, and Belgium in terms of the share of, you know, German, um, of the German economic relationship. Whereas China is massive and if an A, a change in the economic relationship would have a significant impact on European and German prosperity. The, uh, hence, one of the big concerns in Berlin and also in the rest of Europe, which let's not forget, a lot of the Germany's neighbors um, harbor the supply chains, chains for manufacturing that, that is then exported to China. So this is not just a German issue. There is a, a deep network of, of, of production, manufacturing, supply and network um, chains all over Europe that lead to Germany and from there to Beijing. Um, the Trump administration wanted Germany to decouple. The Biden administration, I think, doesn't use that term, but would like us to be more strategic in the way that we, that we protect certain strategic industries and components against the possibility of their being manipulated or used for political purposes by China, which frankly, I think is a completely legitimate request. Um, but there is also a concern that the Biden administration might be, or which as we know, sort of contains a fairly significant number of China hawks who have a very dark reading of what the Xi Jinping regime's goals are globally in Europe and vis-a-vis -vis America. And I think that some of the German political elite are very wor worried about being dragged into, being forced to take sides in a conflict that might end up being militarized. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, there are German companies working in Xinjiang, which, um, I frankly wish wasn't the case. I mean, it seems to me that, that um, there is not least some reputational risk involved to these countries, companies, and, and they may have missed the bus on this particular issue. Um, it's also true that German, that sorry, that Chinese diplomacy has of late, you, you know the term warrior, uh, uh, warrior diplomacy, a wolf warrior diplomacy um, has not been shy in Europe, 
has exerted significant pressure, has attempted to buy physical and digital infrastructure in Europe with the goal of splitting it, with the goal of being able to exert pressure and shape European decisions. Although there, it seems to me that it's notable that the mood in Berlin has changed as a result of that. And let me give you, let me give you two, two instances of that before I shut up um, on, the, on this topic. Um, one, one is that the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi a couple months ago visited Berlin and his, his German counterpart Heiko Maas went out of his way to rebuke him for events in, in, in Xinjiang, the uh, oppression of the Uyghurs, um, oppression of democracy movements in Hong Kong, um, the, the oppression of Tibet, the threats against Tibet. Um, and the Chinese were very upset about this. They had clearly hadn't expected it. And at the same time, you're seeing a distinct movement in the German legislature among the foreign and security experts in Merkel's party, the conservatives, but also in the center left social Democrats to urge a much more cautious and, and, um, and clear policy of vis-a-vis um, -vis Beijing than, than Merkel and her chancery are, are, currently, uh, are currently driving. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tend to think that to some degree, uh, the mood in German political elites has overtaken her. And that may at some point also be true for German businesses, but, but I don't think they're quite there yet. So Constanza, we've talked about Germany's relationship to Russia, about Germany's relationship to China, and those are, of course, both very important in the context of Germany's relationship to the United States. But let's focus now specifically on the German-American relationship. We have this new American president and Joe Biden who's saying America is back, we want to engage in the world, we value our allies. The United States is stronger when it's working closely together with its European partners. We believe in multilateralism. And you, uh, together with a colleague of mine and a group of other Germans, recently wrote a paper saying, Germany, you need to be more ambitious in your right. relationship with the United States. Merkel has just a few months left before an election campaign is going to start off in full force. What do you think can be achieved? in that period of time? Yeah, I, I think that the German-American relationship, uh, you know, has always been replete with angst, um, resentment. We're in many ways, I think, very, very similar to each other in our tendency to, mor tendency to moralize, mm -hmm. our tendency towards a certain rigidity, which then forces, you know, which, which leads us to climb, you know, very high up flagpoles and then have to, and then have to sort of slide down them, if um, events force us to. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we are so uniquely capable of getting up each other's noses. <laughs> that said, the the you know as we've as we've already noted, the uh, Merkel and Obama ended up being very much in sync with each other, and so the advent of the Trump administration was seriously traumatizing for all of Germany and for Merkel in particular, with her reverence for, for America that she had had as a, as a teenager growing up in, in East Berlin. Because, you know, Trump seemed to embody a caricature of the ugly American that transatlanticists like you and me and Merkel had always opposed and had always said was unfair and just, you know, not, uh, not consistent with the reality of American power. And, and not just that, Trump had a particular animus, as we know, against Europe, against the European Union, and against Germany, um, whom he suspected of using the EU as a front to thwart uh, the Trump administration's goals and purposes. And he famously also didn't get along terribly well with Angela Merkel either, who he thought lectured him, and who probably did lecture him. Um, which is not to say that that the French and English charm offensives by by Macron, French President Macron, or uh, Prime Minister Theresa May, or later Boris Johnson, worked that well either. Um, I think very very few things worked ultimately with this particular president. But you're right; the Biden administration, you know, has has sort of en entered, went on stage on January twentieth at twelve o one. 
And we'd all, I think, been holding our breaths ever since January 6th, right? Those of us who live in Washington. Um, with an extraordinarily sort of organized and thought out series of pronouncements, speeches, um, remarks from, from uh, leading up to President Biden's speech at the online Munich Security Conference a, uh, a week ago, and then Secretary of State Tony Biden's first speech. I mean, there is clearly a very thought out approach there, and it is one that puts democracy and allies center stage, and that means center stage for Europe and, and for Germany, which hasn't been the case for four years. So, I mean, there is a bit of whipsawing going on in Berlin, I think. And what concerns me now is, is the following. Um, the Germans and the, and the French and the Brits and everybody else were, were, came out of the gate themselves with, um, and the European Commission for that matter, with detailed, generous, practical proposals for cooperation. And now it seems to me that we are at great risk of being hamstrung again by our own sort of short-term obsessions and our inability to put sort of larger issues first. You mentioned the Chinese um, European Investment Agreement. I tend to think that that in no way precludes a larger German, uh, American, European strategic cooperation. It, its value is at best symbolic. But the timing sure wasn't great. But the problem is, is that we, I think, we here in Washington and folks in European capitals know full well that the Biden administration came into power with very narrow margins and that midterms in America are never far away mm -hmm. and that the majority is that the administration now enjoys might, might flip in 2022. So there's a short time window until the next elections, the midterms in, in November 22, in which you will have both a German national election in September of this year, the end of the Merkel era, and then a French national election in presumably the spring of 2022. Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking at how my own country is handling this, I am quite concerned that we are going to see a degree of sort of introversion and confusion and political fragmentation that will make it exceedingly difficult for the Merkel government to do the kind of things it should be doing as the anchor economy of Europe to help stabilize this transatlantic consensus that we can all see as necessary, but which we might find ourselves almost powerless to implement. And that would be truly tragic. So I am excited that people are sending in questions and we definitely want to get the questions from the audience. But before we do that, Constanza, I want to ask you about one element of Merkel's legacy that we haven't talked about yet. And that is her legacy within Germany, sort of the post-Merkel Germany. And you mentioned Absolutely. the election yep. this September. Uh, her party still seems to be the strongest party in that German political party constellation. Um, who might succeed her as chancellor? What might that coalition look like? Over to you. Yeah, I will try and zip through that very quickly. So the assumption in Washington seems to be here um, that looking at the polls, which have remained astoundingly stable and which see the, the CDU, you know, with a significant advance over everybody else, the Greens usually in second place, the Social Democrats, Merkel's current center-left coalition partners in a grand coalition, never getting above 16%. Um, and the opposition parties of which the largest, alas, is the hard right AFD at usually 10%. And after that, the liberals and Die Linke. Um, the assumption here seems to be, okay, that's a coalition between the uh, German, uh, Merkel's conservatives and the Greens. And the Greens, you know, being far more sort of gung-ho on human rights and democracy and if necessary, military interventions um, are the idea of, um, you know, a lot of, of Washington's sort of fond hopes for, for a, a German coalition that would work really well with the Biden administration. And I'm afraid I worry that that's 
might not happen. And here's why. Um, I think that we've looked now at the CDU leadership contest uh, that ended um, about a month ago with the selection of the governor of North Rhine-Westphalia, Ahmed Laschet, um, as the head of the conservatives and thereby air chancellor candidate presumptive, um, who is troubling for two reasons. One, I think that his foreign and security policy talking points um, haven't really been updated since 1990. Um, I think he's had a less than impressive um, run managing the pandemic in his state, which is one of the largest in, in, in Germany. Um, and his conservative tribe is one of the key tribes in determining the fight for the leadership. And so I think there is a genuine possibility that the two regional elections we, we will see, not this weekend, but the weekend after that, um, might end in a defeat for his party. That then would be an opportunity for a challenger to come forward and to question his ability to lead his party into the elections, which remember are only in, are in September. We're not that far away. This is probably historically one of the shortest elections campaigns in German history. And uh, that, that dark horse, um, whom everybody has been talking about for the last year, could be the Bavarian minister, president, president Markus Söder. Still, I think that this advantage, the pull advantage that the CDU is seeing right now could be a Merkel bump, a Merkel advantage. Mm -hmm. And that given these sort of weaknesses in the leadership contest, this might play out quite differently in the actual election. And ultimately, I think we might, we might have an election night on September 26th with a very unclear coalition mathematic. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, with very unclear coalition maths which again would be normally in election, German election nights, you know by 11 p.m. what the next government is going to look like. Last time around in 2017, it took five, five months of negotiating. Mm -hmm. And since Merkel had run again and won, she was both the head of the caretaker government and the future chancellor. Mm -hmm. This time around, we don't know which party the chancellor will be from. But if the, if the coalition maths aren't clear, Merkel will be the caretaker chancellor after September 26, in which case, if she passes by December 17th, she will have been in power longer than even the longest running chancellor, Helmut Kohl. So I'm afraid I can't give you more certainty than that. I'm, I'm as you may have gleaned from this, a little worried. Well, that makes it exciting. We all have to stay tuned. And uh, there are tuned. lots of great questions that have come in and I'm gonna let Claire jump in and ask those. Thank you so much. So the question I wanna start off with, since we're talking about the upcoming election, this is the questioner is really accusing Merkel of purging qualified ballot members over the years and replacing them with sycophants. And basically saying that because of this, there isn't a qualified person within her party to succeed her. And as a result, uh, perhaps she's been somewhat overvalued as a leader because she didn't prepare uh, succession and didn't encourage independent thinking. How would you respond to that? You know, I, I, um, I think I would beg to differ. Uh, and I suspect that, I mean, I would like to hear Karen's thoughts on this, but, but um, for anybody sort of in any way sort of steeped in German political history, I think a lot of us would say that the, the candidates whom we could think of here mostly stumbled over their own, over their own foibles and, fa and, and failures. And that Merkel had an inimitably elegant way of letting them do that. The exception being her chosen heir, Annegret Kamkarenbauer, the current defense minister, who did make mistakes um, as party leader, which led her to step down last February. And that was what then set off this new search for, for a leader. That was Merkel's one attempt at actually installing someone who she thought would be the right candidate, and it failed. So I'm, I'm sorry, I would have to respectfully disagree with you that she purged people. I think they purged themselves. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
I agree with that. And so I think we'd be happy to take other questions. All right. Robert has a question about Merkel's stance towards authoritarian leaders that emerged in countries like Hungary and Poland. And he's wondering why she hasn't taken a stronger stance opposing them. You know, that's a really, really good question. And it's one that has bothered me for a long time. I actually, it's one of the things that I am quite critical of. I think that without Merkel's protection of Orban's Fidesz in the European Union and in the European Parliament, um, Orban would never have gained quite the power and traction that he did and never have felt so emboldened to really turn Hungary's, just to uh, turn Hungary into a one party state, perpetuating the power of his Fidesz party. Um, and I think one of the reasons why she felt she couldn't do that was that Merkel is very traditionally German in, in one important sense, which is that, that German chancellors have always felt that they needed to be the bridges, the mediators between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And as a East German herself, I think she felt a particular responsibility to, to sort of not come down hard on the Eastern Europeans. She, the, I think that she may have had a bias there that ultimately damaged, damaged the, the European project. Keep in mind also that in, that, that in the French president, Emmanuel Macron, you have a leader who has a number of times insinuated that it might be healthier for the European project if it deepened and became and, and shed some members, some obstreperous members, presumably the Eastern European ones. And that's, that's, that is a price that a German chancellor will never pay. I feel as, as with Nord Stream 2 and, and with standing up to China, I think the, the risk, the, the, the damage of, of a too lenient posture in Berlin was recognized too late and action was taken too late. And so, so some of the damage is done. Karen, what Did do you, you think? Did you want to add anything to that? You know, all I'll add to that is that for the first time in this European Union budget, we're seeing a link made between rule of law and yep. money flowing to member states. And Merkel played a role in that. It's a compromise and it will not go into effect immediately because there's the opportunity for Hungary and Poland to uh, raise some issues with the European Court of Justice, which will delay this provision coming into place, which is very helpful to Orban because he faces an election in the not too distant future. Um, so there's been a change on the EU side, which will take a bit of time to have effect, but I think it's important. Uh, we also saw Orban leave the European People's Party, which is the grouping in the European Parliament that Merkel's CDU is a part of, and Orban's Fidesz has been a part of. And one of the criticisms of Merkel had been that she did not pressure the EPP to boot Fidesz out. And so it'll be interesting to see what this dynamic now means of Orban having decided to leave, no doubt because he was thinking that the EPP was on the verge of kicking him out. So there are, I think, some pieces changing here that Merkel won't be around to see, but I think they're important. And then just a broader point, which is these examples remind us that it is not just the United States that is working to strengthen our democracy. Democracies across Europe are under real pressure right now. And we saw yesterday a decision in Germany to put the opposition party, the AFD, Constanze mentioned them earlier, under surveillance. And so also in Germany, there are challenges to democracy. And my Absolutely. hope is that those challenges can unite us right. around appreciating that democracy is always a work in progress. And we collectively need to focus on how do we strengthen and stay truer to the values we proclaim. Well, that leads to this next question from Lauren, who's asking about what are the security threats to Germany in especially the near term, the next one to five years. And to that, I would just add 
to something that you had written um, just in the last few years, Constanza, about how the decision to allow in migrants didn't result in an increase in Islamic terrorism, but it did result in an increase in right-wing sentiment in Germany. So I'm wondering if one of those security threats might be a domestic security threat. I think absolutely. I think that um, it's become very clear. Um, well, two things have happened. One, the, um, the this unprecedented number, unprecedented number of immigrants from Muslim countries in Northern Africa and the Middle East that came to Germany um, beginning in September 2015, over the course of a whole year, has been either integrated mostly successfully with a small number of, of tragic exceptions, um, or when they weren't, didn't receive asylum sent back. So the worst predictions on that front have not come to pass. But what it did do was to fuel a, the, turn the AFD from a sort of vaguely anti, you know, nationalistic, anti-European integration professor's party into a sort of raging xenophobic, to some degree anti-Semitic um, force that united with street movements like Pegida, like the Identitarians and with, and with neo-Nazi groups. And we've seen, particularly in the course of the last year, a, a visible radicalization and, and disciplining of the leadership, which I think led to the decision to put the party under surveillance. That said, you know, as, as a post-war German, I'm never comfortable when, when sort of politics are decided by the institutions of the state or, or the institutions of the security state. Um, I would prefer this to be decided at the ballot box where it belongs. And the truth is that while the, the AFD's polling has been plateauing um, at around 10% for, for the last year, so it's had a bad pandemic, it still polls much higher in some of the Eastern German states. So again, um, I think I'm, I'm holding my breath a little bit for September 26 to see what that, what that shows us. So Bob Rush is wondering, what was Merkel's role in Brexit? <laughs> oh my, um, that's another really, really, really complicated question. And I was so grateful that until recently, I had my colleague Amanda Sloat at, at, um, at Brookings, whom you could probably wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and she would give you a TV perfect answer to that question. Sadly, she's now the director for Europe in the National Security Council. Um, so she is somewhat less at liberty um, to, uh, to, to explain these things to us. I think, I think frankly, the, the Merkel was probably more inclined than, say, Macron to, to work with the UK for the simple reason that the Germans have always um, appreciated British sort of trade liberalism and an openness and also its willingness to, to contribute to European military security and, and have always considered them allies in, in the shaping of, of Europe's future. I think there is real regret. In fact, I was in Berlin on a trip the day of the Brexit referendum and I remember really vividly bicycling on a rented bike from my hotel to the place where I was working and seeing people coming close to the foreign ministry and seeing people that I knew, including diplomats, standing on the sidewalks, you know, discussing this animatedly. It was clear that for us, this was a watershed moment. But I think that Merkel also grew increasingly frustrated by, by what she felt was, was the lack of professionalism, if I dare say, of the negotiators in, in, in 10 Downing Street mm -hmm. and their lack of a plan. And, and ultimately, you know, this was, this was, much of this was up to the EU to negotiate. And it was unhelpful for, for the, the Johnson government to, to assume that it could do behind, you know, closed doors deals with European, with European leaders and put the, put the European Commission in front of a fait accompli. That was not the way it was ever going to work. Well, we're just about out of time. 
And I said that I would give you the last word. And I saw a tweet earlier today that read, a year ago was our last normal week and nobody knew it. So looking ahead a year, where do you think we'll be? Where do you hope we'll be or a combination of both? Oh my God. Well, I certainly hope that we will be out of the pandemic and that we'll all be vaccined and only wearing masks exceptionally. Although I think that we will be dealing with the impact of the pandemic on our societies, our economies, our politics for a generation. And there may well be variants of the COVID virus for quite a while to come. I think, I think if anything, the pandemic has taught us about the fragility of our own orders, of the fragility of social and European and allied solidarity, the fragility of our democratic institutions, and the degree to which they can be undermined by their enemies from within and outside. And I think that that has, I think, been a moment of humility and introspection for all of us, which was necessary. But I'm also hoping and praying that it will be a creation moment for us because of that insight because we've learned to reevaluate re the importance of community, of neighborliness, of solidarity. And I mean that through both in my, my own European context, in my personal life, but also in transatlantic relations. I mean, and this is the time to do this. And it's, it's, you know, it's time for our entire generation to, to band together and make sure that this doesn't derail. Dr. Donfrey, did you have anything you want to add to that? Well, that was so well said, Constance. And I, I'll return to the theme of Merkel. And I'm struck thinking about her. This is a woman who, as Constance said, grew up in East Germany. And her history and her socialization is so different from what I grew up knowing, which was West Germany. And the pillars of West German foreign policy were the United States, and the European community and then the European Union. Things that Merkel didn't grow up with, yet in her 16 years as chancellor, she absolutely has been a committed Atlanticist to the relationship with the US mm -hmm. and a committed European. And both mm -hmm. of those pillars of Germany's post-war relationship have been shaken in fundamental ways during her tenure. And we talked about the US, the EU, for me, Brexit was an example of that. I mean, Merkel didn't want the UK to leave, the second largest economy. That is absolutely shattering for this experiment in European integration. And then you have on top of Brexit, the pandemic, where at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw Europeans putting in place export bans and closing borders. And that drove her to embrace a solidarity fund in this next generation European Union to actually spend lots of money to build solidarity among member states. And so as I think about Germany going forward in a post-Merkel era, I'm fascinated to see how Germany will define its future when these two key pillars, the United States and the European Union, are changing in fundamental ways at this moment. So I think for everyone who's listened in tonight, this is gonna be a fascinating year plus to watch Germany and to think about what those changes mean for us as Americans and in terms of the way we want to interact with our allies in the world. So that's the thought I'd leave for Absolutely. today. Thanks, Claire. Dr. Stelzemiller, Dr. Donfried, thank you so much. We are so honored you joined us this evening. For anybody who's on the program this evening and they're still interested in this topic, please look into this program that the Brookings Institution is hosting on March 9th on German-US relations. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope you'll join us for our next program on March 11th on police reform in America. Good night, and thank you all. It was Bye. such a pleasure, and always follow GMS programming as well. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, thank Karen, you. for doing this. Thank you, Claire. Thank you.